Good morning, everybody. Hello, and welcome to the Florida Friendly Landscaping um, Professional Webinar Series. We are going to, um, sorry for starting a few minutes late here. Um, we are going to get started. I'm going to let people have a chance to continue logging on before we dive into the actual presentation by Dr. Hansen today. I'll go through some housekeeping while people are logging on now. So once again, I want to say good morning and welcome you to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Professional Webinar Series. Today's webinar is Selecting Your Style, taking a look at some FFL landscape styles with Dr. Gail Hansen. You'll notice your microphones have been muted, um, so please put your questions in the chat box and we'll take them at the end of the presentation. Um, this webinar has been approved for one CEU from FFLCP, LIAF, and FNGLA. If you're interested in a CEU and need a certificate of completion, please follow the um, link that I'll put in the chat box and you can make payment and put in your licensing information. I'll be submitting the CEUs to the licensing agency at the end of the week so you can expect your certificate by Friday. Um, and this is part of our monthly webinar series that's held on the second Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. So we're going to continue that same um, schedule into 2024, and we're going to start the year off with a lethal bronzing update with Dr. Brian Batter. Um, and we're really excited to have him talk on that very timely topic um, in, in January. So one final thing is, is you will receive a survey invitation pop up. So please take a, a moment to fill that out at the end of this um, webinar. We really appreciate it and it helps us determine what to offer in the future. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Tom Wickman to introduce today's speaker. Thank you so much, Claire, and welcome, everybody. We're glad you can be part of our professional webinar series uh, this week, and it's my pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker. Um, Dr. Hansen is an associate professor in the Department of Environmental Horticulture and, a, and an extension specialist in sustainable landscape design. Her teaching and extension programs address sustainable, science-based, and art-centered landscape design practices that take into account the social dimension of green urban environments, environmental protection, and the quality of life for urban dwellers. Dr. Hansen graduated with a master's and PhD in landscape architecture from the University of Florida and currently teaches courses in residential landscape design and advanced residential landscape design. In 2013, Dr. Hansen received the Teacher Fellow Award from the North American Colleges and Teachers of Agriculture. Her research activities focus on landscape performance metrics and strategies for aligning visual quality and environmental function for Florida-friendly landscapes. Dr. Hansen is faculty in the Center for Land Use Efficiency and is an advisor to the Florida-friendly landscaping program. Today, Dr. Hansen is going to help you understand more about Florida-friendly landscapes. So it's my pleasure to turn the program and the floor over to Dr. Gail Hansen. All right, Tom, thank you very much for that introduction, as long as it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I do have to, I have to give you guys a new bio because um, actually I've been a professor for about three years. So that tells you how old that bio is. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for it. Certainly. Uh, so uh, good morning, everyone. Today I wanted to talk about Florida-friendly landscape styles. And I'm um, going to be introducing you to a book that um, actually Claire and Jen Marvin and myself and um, two landscape architecture students have been working on. Um, I'm a little embarrassed to say we started working on this book before COVID hit. And then, you know, COVID happened and then all the stuff after COVID. So we are um, gearing back up and um, getting closer, much closer to getting this book finished. But um, it's a good opportunity for me to talk about Florida Friendly Landscape Styles. Let's see if we can. So the reason why we decided to write this book is because every time that we would talk to people and we heard this a lot from um, different um, agents around this state, we would encourage people to uh, have a Florida-friendly landscape. And uh, they would always kind of look at us and kind of go, um, well, uh, what does it look like? 
um, because everybody wants to know and make sure that they are going to have a very nice landscape, of course, and they have an idea about what they want their landscape to look like. So we used to fumble around a little bit with the answer. And finally, I kind of defaulted to saying, well, what do you want your landscape to look like when I was talking to my clients? And I said that because I said we could make any landscape a Florida-friendly landscape, regardless of what it looks like. And so we decided to write a book about this to kind of explain this idea. And uh, basically, the look of a landscape can be created by a particular style, if you had uh, you know, a style in mind. It could be a type of landscape, or it could be based on the function. And often your landscape has all three of those. And so the look is really just about the visual attributes or the characteristics, the physical characteristics that you see. And it could be based on the type of plants you're using. Uh, it could be the distinct features in the landscape. And it's also about how you organize the plants and the different features. So just to give you an example, a style of a landscape might be something like a cottage style or contemporary or modern, or it could be a cultural one like a Spanish or Asian influence. And a type of landscape would be something, and we get a lot of um, actually requests for this, uh, a natural landscape or one that looks like a woodland or a coastal landscape maybe one that's on the waterfront. And then the function might be that a lot of people say, well, I'd like my landscape to be drought tolerant, for example, or flood tolerant, or a pollinator landscape, or you know, uh, creating homes for wildlife. So all of those things can come into play in a landscape. For example, you could have a cottage style landscape that also supports wildlife and looks very natural. So we're going to talk about all those different styles that we're going to present in our book, but we're also, we also want to give people more information in this book. And one of the really important things about your landscape is starting with the form, because that ultimately is going to help you organize your space and then put all of your different plants in the right place and get all those characteristics that you need for the style that you would like. So when we talk about form, all gardens have form um, because everything around us has form. That's how we recognize um, things in our world um, by the form or the shape of them. And it's the shape of the elements and the spaces. So for example, this landscape that you're looking um, at right here, you'll notice some very distinct forms in it. There are a lot of um, kind of squares and rectangles, um, a lot of straight lines. You would probably call this a very contemporary landscape. Um, so it has some um, very well-defined forms in the organization of both the house and the landscape there. So for the type of garden, all gardens do have function, but some are designed for a more specific function. And then, uh, for example, if you are um, trying to do a drought tolerant landscape, you might design it more for that. And so then certain characteristics come along with that style. Many people, for example, think when you say drought tolerant that it would be more of kind of an arid looking landscape. And then there's the style. So the style is that combination, like I said, of form, function, plants, materials, and features all put together. So a Florida friendly landscape, it can have many different forms. It can be geometric, it can be organic. Uh, it can have many different functions. It can save water, support your wildlife, support pollinators but it can be re represented visually by many different styles. So that's what we landed on for our book. We said we're going to introduce a lot of different styles that a Florida friendly landscape could be.
So um, some of the design considerations that we put in the book are kind of like the anatomy of a yard. Um, we, we talk about the front yard. And in the front yard, we're mostly concerned with curb appeal. Uh, we have to think about property value because obviously it's a big investment for many people. And um, when they go to sell it, they are thinking about the value of their property. Uh, another huge influence in what your front yard looks like is the social norms, which are the types of landscapes that you find generally in your neighborhood. You're highly influenced by the, the neighborhood aesthetic when you're thinking about your own landscape. And then the other big thing is maintenance. And one of our big things with Florida Friendly is talking about uh, maintenance and uh a lot of people ask for low maintenance landscapes and that's a very reasonable request. And so the front yard is kind of the public space of your yard. The side yard, we generally think of those as your work zones where your utilities are. Um, you probably have fences along your side yards. Um, you may have um, swales, drainage swales and so forth. Um, it's kind of more the, the work area of the yard. And then your backyard is your private zone. So that's where we think more about function. Like what kind of activities do you wanna do in your backyard and, and also about maintenance too. And all of this can be affected by homeowner association um, rules and regulations for your landscape. So that's another level that we need to bring into these when we think about um, these different styles. Many of your um, issues are with your homeowner association really only applies to your front yard, but I have worked with some associations where they also have regulations about your backyard too. The other thing that we introduce in this book are some of the key urban ecology concepts that uh, we thought about as we were designing these different landscape styles uh, to be put in the book. So uh, quickly, some of the, the um, concepts that we wanted to illustrate in these designs were biodiversity. So a variety of plant species and um, trees and native plants in particular. And so in this drawing here, if you look at, at the trees um, where the number one is in the box, it, that's represented in biodiversity and also number four, all the plant material in the plant beds in the front of the house there. Um, having a resilient landscape. Again, a resilient landscape has a variety of species, um, a lot of trees and uh, typically ways to control water because resiliency is, is, especially here in Florida is going to be very important with climate change. Um, you know, we anticipate having more drought, uh, more um, storms, more floods, and so forth. So being, being able to control water is, is going to be uh, an issue for a lot of yards. Uh, we want to have a sustainable yard. Again, looking at the plant species, um, that they are hardy, they're um, pest um, resistant, um, low maintenance, low water, all of those play into being more a more sustainable landscape. Also the hardscape though. So we're looking at things like uh, number two on here, the driveway with permeable pavers um, and um, other hardscape elements that you use that are sustainable. And then low maintenance also makes your yard uh, more sustainable, obviously, if you're not using pesticides and a lot of herbicides and a lot of fertilizer. We also, of course, want um, our yard to be very functional. And again, that is um, plant species. So you're probably seeing a, a trend here because every single one of these has plant species listed in it. But functional in terms of hardscape, uh, designed for the use or the purpose so that it does function for you um, in, in a way that you want it to. And, uh, um, and then the last one is aesthetics. Again, um, you know, when 
when we're doing a design for a yard, we want it to look beautiful. That That's, you know, one of our main purposes so that we can be out in our yard, we can enjoy it, our neighbors can enjoy it. So plant species again, um, and hardscape, we're looking at the visual quality and also the emotional appeal. Um, if we find that we, we find, uh, have emotions such as joy and, and um, uh, when we're looking at our landscape and we feel very good about our landscape, we have pride in it. Um, we tend to take better care of our landscape and we care more about the landscape and about the plants and the animals and, and so forth that enjoy our landscape. So there's very much a, an emotional side to um, designing a landscape. <clears throat> We also talk about in the book, and this um, image on the right here is uh, just a mock-up of one of the pages in the book, but we talk about planting design principles. So it, when you're reading the book, it can kind of help guide you if you are doing a design for your own yard, talking about the organization, how we create spatial organization. We use pathways, we use plants, we use hardscape. Um, proportion and scale, uh, how the plants that you use and the features you design in your yard should be both house and human scale. So it feels comfortable to be in the space. Uh, repetition is really important. We tend to repeat materials, including plants for a more unified look. Um, variety is important. So even though we're telling you to use a lot of repetition, we also want you to create interest with colors and textures and forms um, so that those repeated materials don't get um, too boring in the landscape. And then composition. How do you arrange your plants in masses and uh, make them look good and, and make them also more functional for wildlife? For example, we always uh, tell people to put uh, plants in clusters or, or clumps um, so that they have, um, they're more visible in the landscape. But that's also a very good thing to do for pollinator landscapes because we know that, and Dr. Jarrett Daniels has taught us that it's better to have our plants in kind of large clumps of maybe about three, at least three feet by three feet clumps because a lot of um, birds and pollinators and uh, bees especially are nearsighted and they can see the plants better when they're in large clumps. And then emphasis, um, creating focal points in the yard, just, and, and that's mostly as an aesthetic appeal um, design principle. The other thing that we touch on is what do people like and what don't they like in the yard? So this is landscape preferences um, and also how people perceive plant, um, perceive landscapes. We know this, we know that people, um, there's been many studies about this and we've done focus groups ourselves. So we know people like colorful flowers, um, tend to prefer more naturally neat looking plants um, plants with large, broad leaf foliage with a very distinct form. Um, people do prefer organization to give it a little more complexity, a little bit more interest, uh, open views, um, trees, and um, a well-maintained landscape. Actually, in all the focus groups that we've done, we have learned that that is one of the main things that make people like landscapes is that it is well-maintained and not messy looking. What they don't like usually are brown or yellowing leaves, uh, reminds them of dead plants, um, small light color flowers, really tiny foliage or messy form like tangled up stems or branches and um, no variety in the plants. So it's a little bit boring. So I put these two images on here because it was very interesting. We were doing a study on um, stormwater ponds and we actually um, showed people participating in the study, the, the plain um, shoreline with just the turf, the bottom image there, 
And we gave them some cutout plants that they could drag and drop onto the screen and they could actually design their own, you know, shoreline for this um, pond here. And uh, I just put an example of one of the shorelines that one of the participants designed. And you can see that they followed the principles. They clustered the plants, um, they put them in groupings. And so uh, this person did a, actually a pretty good job, but it also reflected what they liked about the landscape. And so that was a, an interesting study that I just wanted to show you to kind of show you how people think about um, landscapes. So the books in the page, the book pages are going to have six pages for each landscape style that we did. And I think we have 22 different landscape styles in the book. So the first one, and this is an example of a drought tolerant landscape, and it'll have the design goals and design tips. Um, it'll describe the design and it'll have for, for each of the designs that we did, a the metrics so it tells you how many plants are in the entire um, design that we did the different plant types like different how many trees how many shrubs how much ground cover the size of the site and the size of the house and the driveway so if you are flipping through the book and you see one a design that you really like you can try to kind of mat match it to the size of your own home and your own driveway and and uh like your backyard and front yard and then each one of them has a design and i'm going to show you some examples that we've done and then there will be another page and it'll have uh, different characteristics some of the character details of that particular yard and then uh, there will be a plant list for both North Florida, Central Florida, and South Florida. So hopefully we've captured everybody and all of their uh, needs in this book. So I'm just gonna show you some examples of uh, some of the styles that we have uh, designed. First one is the managed natural style. And this is one that we're getting a lot more requests for. So they want a, a, a landscape that is densely planted, more organic in form, like organic pathways, a lot more trees, a lot more shrub layers, maybe a pond in it. Um, typical other uh, details might be a wood fence or other wood you know, elements such as benches and maybe bird houses and bird baths. So these images here are some of them that you will find in the book. And uh, they kind of show you what we are thinking is a typical kind of managed natural look. So this is the design that we did for that. And, you know, and I'm going to just kind of quickly show you the designs for each one. And this is a list of some typical plants. I think all of the um, lists of the plants that I'm going to show you here, or at least most of them are for North Florida, because all of us working on the book are up here in Gainesville and North Florida. And so we started with the North Florida plant list. Um, but here you can see we have a bird bath, we have a bench for viewing, some bird houses, we have a some mulch trail along the side and a little trail that you can walk through on uh, the through the backyard there. Um, and here's another one. So this is our drought, drought toler tolerant one. You um, saw a little bit of the image there, but some of the things that we would expect to find in a drought tolerant landscape might be like dry creek beds, um, containers and planters, uh, uh, plant material wise, more grasses, maybe some succulents, some agave, um, a much more use of gravel, a mulch, and maybe some stones and boulders. So you can see it's kind of tending a little bit more toward a, um, a little bit of an arid look, but it doesn't necessarily have to look that way, but these are kind of some characteristics of it and uh, tending toward more natural materials. So you can see some of the pictures that we are um, using, uh, for example, this dry creek bed, although uh, I wouldn't necessarily put your 
dry creek bed right through some of your utility um, elements in your yard. I think those are little vault boxes, utility vault, vault boxes that they put their creek right through it. Um, but some more rocks and, and maybe uh, a little bit like raised planters with a rock, uh, rocks around it. So those are some typical descriptive characteristics maybe of a drought tolerant yard. And here's our plan for that and the plant list that goes along with that. Um, so in this particular plan in the back, you can see there's some dry creek beds that we have uh, designed so that the um, excess water on the site will flow into the turf area and help to irrigate the turf. A dry creek bed along the side of the house goes along the side of the patio and into the turf area in the back. Um, again, more mulch areas along the side of the yard. We tended to put more, more mulch areas along the side of the yard as uh, ways to get to the back yard and also to keep plant material a little bit farther away from the side of the house, um, which is typically a good practice anyway. You should have a gap between your plant material and the side of your house for easier maintenance of your house. <clears throat> so a contemporary landscape. Um, what you would typically find in a contemporary landscape would be perhaps uh, more structures like arbors or pergolas, uh, maybe some conservatory or a small little greenhouse maybe, um, stone patios and planters. So like this picture on the far um, right here is uh, an image of, uh, and this one actually is not in Florida, but I was, um, having a hard time finding an image of a more contemporary look here. But what it shows is this is the front yard of a house. And they actually did a raised planter. So their entire front yard is this raised planter with the um, patio right next to it that goes into their front entrance of their house. Um, sculptures are oftentimes found in contemporary landscapes, um, outdoor entertainment areas lawn panels, more straight lines. So lawn panels may be in squares or rectangles. And some of the arbors or pergolas wouldn't be kind of your typical ones. It might be a picture like this one that shows a, a curved arbor. Um, so some more unique elements in a contemporary landscape. So this was our plan for the contemporary landscape. And you can see that there are the square lawn panels, um, an arbor. This one actually is a larger lot, has a, a guest house on it, um, pools, uh, water features, and so forth. A lot of more straight lines here. And then uh, in particular, the plant material, a lot of palm trees, the date palm, cabbage palm, and some more um, plants that we might say are larger, more bold, more um, coarse texture plants are typically used in, in a contemporary landscape. Another one that we were uh, added to the book um, of our 22 styles is the mid-century modern. We actually have a lot of mid-century modern houses here in Gainesville. And it was a very popular style and still is, and is actually coming back more into style. More and more people are having their new houses built in this um, mid-century modern style. Um, some of the hallmarks are usually swimming pools, um, well-defined plant beds, using, again, bold, large-scale plants, a lot of uh, river rock or mulch or gravel. A uh, minimalist plant palette, however, um, is a, a typical for mid-century modern. And by minimalist, we don't mean not using a lot of plants. We just mean not a, uh, a, a real uh, big variety of plants. Having a strong indoor-outdoor connection. So some of the built elements are um, connected to the house. Um, 
And if you're familiar with mid-century modern, you know a colorful front door is, is a hallmark too. Maybe some modern sculptures and people who uh, really like the mid-century modern also tend to go toward the furniture of that period and like um, pots, pottery, or containers of that period. So these are just some examples of so how what a yard might look like and what some of the furniture might look like. And so here's our plan. We have not, um, I did not get a chance to put the plant list on this one, but I did want to show you uh, the plan and how it might play out. This was actually a home that we did a design for, and it was very interesting because it was um, a two-story home and it was an all glass wall in the back of the house from um, ceiling to floor. And so you could stand at the glass wall and look out over the swimming pool. And uh, if you had been able to open that, that glass wall, you could literally just dive straight into the pool from the house. So very mid-century modern, but you can see a lot more straight lines, more decks, the pool and, and, uh, um, you know, some more uh, interesting arrangement of the plant material. <laughs> so one thing, though, that I did want to uh, talk about a little bit here is what's in a name. So we talk about what is modern versus contemporary, and also what is a landscape versus a garden. And when we talk about modern, what we mean is typically the mid-century modern. So anytime someone says, I want a modern landscape, they're really referring to a landscape that was, you know, originated in the 1950s and 60s with that architectural and, and specific garden style. But that is different from a contemporary landscape. And a lot of people use those interchangeably. A contemporary landscape is a style that is currently popular. Like what is is the um, the trends, and it, it can be they can be informed or inspired by other styles, but it's just what's trending at the moment. That's what the contemporary is. But we tend to think of contemporary as having some <clears throat> some particular design characteristics that I just showed you earlier. There's also a difference between a landscape and a garden. So a landscape is your entire yard. It's the planted space as a complete unit. And it typically includes gardens within that unit. So the gardens, for example, are smaller spaces within the landscape. And it could be a, like a cut flower garden, a bog garden, a rain garden, a water garden. And like this example shows a raised bed garden. So I put this picture in here because it shows the difference between actually modern and contemporary and a landscape and a garden. So we see a pergola, which was um, you know, a part of a modern style from the mid-century modern pergolas, but it's done in a very contemporary way because in the mid-century modern, they didn't typically do pergolas that were circular like this. So this is the contemporary twist on a mid-century modern um, element. And it's a really kind of cool because it's kind of a two for one. Not only do you get the circles above you, but it also casts that very nice shadow pattern. It's also a much larger landscape. So you can see, um, you know, in the distance, you can see a large landscape, but it has a couple of small gardens. So this Pergola is actually a grape garden. It's a grape arbor. So that, it, you know, is a, a small garden into itself. And then you see the planters in the back, which is another raised bed garden within the context of a bigger landscape. So trying to keep those uh, names all separate, I think is helpful too when you're thinking about styles. So I wanted to put this landscape in just because it's a full-on contemporary landscape. There's uh, no doubt about it. If um, uh, you have uh, ever been to the Wave Hotel in Lake Nona, uh, this is in the back of the hotel. It is actually a 
um, private sculpture garden, but anybody can go. You can go to the hotel, walk through the lobby and go out and look at it. It's an amazing garden. And uh, if you think that it looks like artificial turf, you're right, it is artificial turf. Um, the reason why they put that in is because they hold a lot of events um, back there and it was much more um, durable with so many people walking on it. And a lot of people do come and tour the garden. So um, it's a private collector and it's his private um, sculptures that are in there and he's the one that funded the garden. And it's a really fun garden if you ever get a chance to go and visit it, but it's also kind of the uh, ultimate in a contemporary garden. So another uh, common landscape that we have here, obviously, is the coastal yard. Um, a lot of coastline in Florida. So we typically see dune grasses and shrubs, um, palm trees, more natural materials like stone and wood and crushed shells. Uh, ocean inspired ornaments and uh, pathways, natural organic pathways and gathering areas um, are more typical. And uh, this is the coastal yard, the design that we did for it, um, a, a kind of a more narrow, uh, smaller yard, a little bit of turf in the back, but you can see we have cabbage palm, sand live oak, um, dwarf palmettos there, um, river oats, mealy grass, and, and of course we have to have beach sunflower, it's on the coast, and blanket flower. So just to give you an idea of some of the plants that we're leaning toward on these. And then of course we also have to have the tropical yard because we are in the uh, tropics or subtropics here. And these are just some of the kind of looks that you might find in a tropical yard, colorful flowers, uh, obviously tropical plants and fruits, more natural material, uh, maybe a pond or a creek, palm trees, um, you know, iconic for Florida. Typically tend more towards some smaller turf areas and more dense plantings and just a lot more plants, you know, packing the plants in and, and color even in the furniture, <clears throat> more colorful furniture. And uh, this was the plan view for our tropical yard. Cabbage palms, date palms, bottle brush, bird of paradise, philodendron, shell ginger, all of these bromeliads, all of these are plants that you might find in a, in a tropical yard, but we also have our little turf area with our hammock in the back, a couple of gathering areas, a um a deck um as part of the entryway and uh an orchid house crushed shell pathways along the side and i think this is the last one that i'm going to show you um the pollinator yard we get a lot of requests for pollinator yards uh, kind of goes along with the woodland yard or the natural yard but in a pollinator yard you'd find a lot more wildflowers and a lot more flowering and native shrubs and trees, flowering perennials. Uh, you might even have a little butterfly house, um, like the one that's up in the upper right-hand corner. Um, you'd want to have a butterfly um, puddling area, a little place where there's some mud and a little water, uh, perhaps an apiary or a bee box, um, bird feeders and bird baths, and uh, possibly even a bat house. <laughs> So here's our pollinator yard. Um, we have our deck here with our uh, perennial gardens. <coughs> Excuse me, we added some apiaries here in the yard, uh, a grow house, and uh, here's our puddling station um, down here by the turf. Uh, we did a lot of research on, on the best locations for apiaries if you're going to have them in your backyard. I know that in some areas that's not allowed um, by your HOA codes, but if you can have them in your backyard, there is a certain distance that they need to be from your house. Um, and then there's the list of um, typical plants that you might want to have, for example, your milkweeds and then your wildflowers, coreopsis or coneflower, blanket flower. And uh, for shrubs, your butterfly bush and your sweet pepper bush. <laughs> 
Oh, I guess I do have another one. Your Spanish traditional. I think I put this one in here because I know that this is a, a very um, popular um, style here in Florida. Um, the use of colorful tiles, kind of an old world quality. So that's why we're calling it Spanish traditional. But you could also go more contemporary with a Spanish um, style. Um, Three-tiered fountains were always popular, gated courtyards um, with arched entryways and, you know, an, kind of an elaborate gate, um, a, a, a pergola or, or, or loggia along the side of the house, um, lush plantings. Um, all of these are kind of evocative of a, a traditional old um, Spanish style landscape. And... Uh, so when we designed this one, we put a kind of a courtyard patio in the front yard and also one in the back. And as you can see, we we um, trimmed the patios with blue tiles uh, to give it a little bit of color because um, in the hardscape of a more traditional Spanish house, there's usually more color. Um, and then having planters with, I think these were the mix of agave and dicia and an aloe mix in the planters having the um, pergola overhead and some um, features, a little water feature fountain um, at the front entrance there. Typical plants would be like your olive trees, um, Chickasaw plum, Texas sage, and um, we had the purple fountain grass in this particular one. So when you're looking at these plants on each page of your book, you can look obviously at the plant list and that's why we put numbers instead of labeling the plants. Each symbol has a number by it. And so you can look at either North, Central, Central or South Florida, and there will be a different plant. For example, on this one, the number five in each list will be a different plant. And then each of these numbers, number six, seven, and eight, they'll all be different plants depending on where um, you are located. Mm -hmm. Cottage yard, real quickly, these are some um, details that you might expect to see in a cottage yard, some colorful plants, picket fences, a lot more garden ornaments, a little more playful look, um, a small turf area, some dense plantings. <clears throat> and this is what a cottage yard might look like, All no turf in the front, but um, very dense plantings, um, colorful plant beds. So we have um, different plants in there that will, like the beach sunflower, the false rosemary, the pineland lantana, bulbine, and the Stokes aster, all very colorful uh, ground cover. The city yard, we put that in there because that's getting very popular in all the new developments in Florida, tiny little postage stamp size yards, um, short entry walks, small plant beds, a lot of use of container gardens, low garden fences, um, typical. The porch is very um, coming back. It's making a comeback and the type of furniture that you put on your porch and your container plants give a lot of character to the yard. And so obviously we drew one that is a very small, narrow lot um, because that's what they look like now in, in a lot of new developments. Asian and Japanese is a surprisingly, we get a lot of requests for this style um, and uh, more leaning toward the Japanese um, style. So I'm looking at my time here and I think we're getting close to running out of time. So I'll just look at really quickly you know, um, plants like bonsai plants, so water features, uh, Japanese lanterns, um, stone lanterns, anything that has, gives it some more of that Asian or Japanese kind of feel. And here's our woodland one, secret pathways, um, rustic fences and furniture, uh, more open spaces, but also kind of semi-organized dense planting. And uh, now I think I'm finally getting to the last couple of slides here. We also have in the book some tips on why landscapes fail and uh, some pictures. And I think you can pretty much tell just by looking at these pictures that these are failed landscapes. And what we call a failed landscape is any landscape that doesn't serve its purpose. 
So you have a landscape and it's just not working for you. Functionally, it doesn't work. For example, the patio there, there's literally not even enough room to put your chairs around your table on that patio. Ecologically, um, the stormwater pond there obviously is a big miss on that. It doesn't support other species. Um, aesthetically, it's very unattractive. And then the house with the large shrubs in the front, not a biodiverse landscape, uh, low visual quality, and literally low visual ability from inside the house there. And um, place making and place attachment is another thing that we talk about in the book because place making is really important as you think about your design. It's about creating a home and a neighborhood identity, making a place. And um, it's very important to kind of look around your neighborhood and your area, your city, your town that you live in and think about the place where you're at and trying to fit in excuse me, to that place. Also place attachment. When you grow up in a place or you live there and you really like it, you have an emotional bond with it. The place has meaning to you. And um, that could be, your yard can be part of that. Um, the plant material that you use should make the place feel special, um, feel real and feel vital. Like it's a lively place. And by real, we mean not putting that artificial turf in your yard um, unless it's a really small amount that you need for a, an area for a pet or something like that. Um, we talk about image, about how in Florida we think of Florida as being very green and charming and attractive and, in, and for some people it could have some spiritual elements to it. And then thinking about um, Uses and activities, your space should be useful. It should be fun. Your yard should be vital and sustainable. And when you go out in your yard, you should have a, a feeling of um, it being restorative and, and making you feel good. And so that's all about making a place and your yard is your place and um, having and being attached to your yard. So, um, just to wrap it up, I just wanted to show you a really fun picture. I think that um, Jen actually uh, had sent me this picture a long time ago, but this is an artist in Brazil. He's a street, um, he does street murals, but he always includes plants in his murals. So he finds a place where there's a wall and a plant growing over it, and he'll do a, a painting um, for it and um, so you can look up his name if you wanna see, he does some really fabulous work, but I thought it was really fun. And I, since I was just talking about your yard being fun and vital and interesting, um, I decided to end it with this slide and um, show you a really fun landscape here. So thank you very much for um, attending this webinar. Gail, thank you so much. You covered so much. You give us a, a lot to think about and <laughs> got quite a few questions. Um, if you can talk a little bit about uh, the book, um, you know, who can they, you know, where can they find it? Who's the author? Um, will it be print or digital um, and availability? Okay, so uh, it's not finished yet. We're about 75% done. So we're hoping that um, in the next six months, we have it completely done. And our plan right now is we're working with the IFAS bookstore and um, we have already sent them samples and they're excited to work with us on that. And so we're um, talking a little bit about the form. So it will be, I believe at this point, printed It'll, and um the bookstore is starting now to think about the IFAS bookstore about some digital formats. So it may be both. We'll see. And so um, by the time IFAS gets all of our materials and gets it done, I'm guessing it's it's going to be getting toward more of fall of 2024 before it's out. Okay. Um, Not far off. That that time yeah. will fly. Yeah. But I think, you know, from, from some of the comments I saw, they're really looking forward to to this to be able to utilize with their 
uh, with their HOAs and, and their communities to try and sway landscape, uh, landscape design and landscape specs. Okay, great. Um, one of the other things, do you have any tips to try and sway an HOA to accept these, these sorts of concepts? Um, yes, actually, um, I do have a presentation that I, I have given on how to work with your HOA. Um, and I think that uh, Jen or Claire may have that presentation. And I'm happy to give it to you guys, too, in, in a PDF format that you can uh, distribute to people if they want it. But um, it's talking about this exact thing and that idea of being able to show them what your yard is going to look like and um, what's going to be in your yard and giving them some um, visual idea because they also, your HOA also doesn't understand when you say, I want to do a Florida friendly yard. They don't have any concept either of what that's going to look like. And we have found in our focus groups that they have the same kind of the same issue with thinking that Florida friendly is going to look like um, no plants and all rocks and, um, you know, uh, kind of a, a barren landscape, I guess you would call it, because they're associating that with the old term of xeriscape. And xeriscape brings to mind a kind of desert looking um, right. And, uh, you know, an actual a Florida friendly yard can be very lush and very green. It just you just pick the right plants because right plant, right place is the main design element of Florida friendly. Um, so when you work with them, try to show them uh, images, try to show them what it could look like, show them other Florida friendly yards. Um, and I know the Florida Friendly Program has some archives with pictures in it. And um, just to show them, allay their fears that it won't look like a desert, basically. <clears throat> and that right. show them that you can follow their HOA codes and still be Florida friendly. I love that. Wonderful, Gail. Thank you. The, um, the name of the book will be? Um, I think we're just going to call it right now Florida Friendly Landscape Styles. Fantastic. We were trying to figure out how to fit, you know, form and all of those other things in there. And it got too long. And we said, let's just group it all under the Florida friendly styles. <laughs> well, and, you know, that's it's one of the things that, you know, certainly we'll be able to highlight once uh, once it comes out on the Florida friendly landscaping website as well. So, um, you know, that people can always go there. Will the book highlight native um, which plants are native and which are not? From yes, here. we do. Uh, on the plant list, there will be like an asterisk or something by it that all the native plants will have that. So when you just go down the plant list and you'll see that we tried, um, we um, did a fairly big effort to get, um, I think, close to 75 percent of the plants that we used as native plants, because I, I don't think a lot of people realize that a, most of the trees that you can get at your in your standard nursery are native trees and a lot of the shrubs that you can get at your uh, nursery are native shrubs. The problem is that, and we run across this all the time, not everybody has a good native plant nursery close by. And sometimes it's a huge challenge to get more native plants, even some of the wildflower plants and stuff. So, so we had we had to, our rule is kind of to aim for 75% native um, and then 25% um, ornamental plants because there's some very good, very high performance, we call them plants that are ornamental plants that are very drought tolerant, very pest resistant, and they perform very well. And uh, they're not high maintenance. And so they're very good Florida friendly plants that you can have in your yard. So you don't have to go all native to be Florida friendly. And um, in many ways, we think that you can even be, you know, 50, 50, 50% 50 native plants and 50% ornamental, and you can still be very Florida friendly. It's just um, picking the ornamental plants that are high performance, um, 
what well, you know they have all the characteristics that we think of as a high performance plant terrific gail that contemporary <laughs> ultra contemporary garden in lake nona that you uh, showed the slide of uh -huh. um, you mentioned it was at a hotel can you say where that uh, where that hotel is or what the name of the hotel is so it's called the wave hotel and um, it's just south of the airport, of the um, Orlando Airport, Orlando International Airport. It's just south of there. In fact, I think a lot of people stay there because it's a five minute drive to the airport from there. But um, there is a parking garage. You can just park there and you can go and just walk through the lobby of the hotel and out into that garden. And um, the it's a very wealthy um, developer, I believe, who funded that garden and it's his private sculpture collection and you just saw a, a very small part of it in that picture that I had there that it's it's really unique I um I really enjoyed walking around seeing all of his different sculptures some of them are huge and um but it's quite the landscape also <laughs> I mean very interesting awesome um somebody was mentioning that uh, they had you know a uh an older landscape, 20 plus years old mm -hmm. uh, and in their subdivision and the tree roots are starting to affect the, the infrastructure. They're lifting sidewalks and streets and things. Um, they wanted to know, how do you deal with that? The, can they cut the roots? Um, you know, is that advisable? Or are there other strategies? So not really advisable to cut the roots. If you want your tree to stay healthy and it's a large tree and um, it's a very important part of your landscape, which they usually are, when they get to a certain size, um, you would prefer to protect the um, tree. <laughs> what we often do in the back, if people are having their patios, for example, buckling, the concrete's buckling, um, if possible, we tell them just to break out the concrete, um, take it out and um, redesign the patio into a different shape and or if possible, um, build a deck instead and have like a platform deck that is maybe just on piers about six inches above the ground and uh, that way your roots can be underneath your deck and you can literally build your deck around the tree because you don't need too many piers and they can be just set on the surface. So that's one option that we've had homeowners do, but it's usually preferable to, to break out whatever. I know uh, sometimes in the front, if it's the sidewalk that's being buckled, uh, that's usually not, the homeowner can't do anything about that. That's, um, you know, the the developer or the builder or the city or whoever, it's usually in the rights of way. So the city is more responsible for that or county or if it's in their rights of way. But um, so not much you can do about a sidewalk except bug them to fix it for you. Um, but in the back, it depends on how important the tree is to you. Cutting the roots will probably eventually kill it. And so at that point, you, you might want to just take the tree down. Um, but I would do everything that you could initially to redo the hardscape. I know a lot of uh, a lot of areas on campus here, um, as well as, you know, a lot of municipalities and things will ridge over roots. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of ways to deal with that so that, you know, you don't have to cut the roots. And, you yeah. know, there's, Trees do add a lot to a landscape, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, one other question that uh, I had was, do you encourage edible plants? Okay, so that's an interesting question. Um, we are right now working on a project where we are looking at how you can incorporate edible plants into your plant beds um, and uh, looking at uh, different plants that don't need quite as much water because one thing about edible plants is a lot of them do need more water and if you're going to use edible plants that are um, needing more water and we are trying you know with a uh, Florida friendly to be more use less water obviously that our recommendation is that you use raised beds then you have your edibles in raised beds with a drip system on them and uh, use good soil that, so soil that's going to hold more of the uh, moisture in it. And because 
you know, here in Florida, we have so much, such sandy soil that even with a drip system, sometimes it drains so quickly. But using a raised bed, and it doesn't have to be a tall one, maybe just, you know, six to eight inches so that you can put a good layer of good soil in a drip system. So that way, it's a very small area of your yard that needs more water. Um, it's a basically hydro zoning with mm -hmm. edible plants. Um, but we're also looking at ways you can actually put them into your plant bed and trying to, um, you know, in the plant bed itself using more drought tolerant edibles. So some of them might be more unusual edibles that people don't, you know, really think of that um, they can grow in their yard. Um, so yeah, it's it's basic hydrozoning is what it is. <clears throat> uh, last question I've got for you, Gail. Um... Can you discuss, you know, Florida statutes on environmentally friendly landscaping? You know, are you seeing a trend, um, any any particular trends out there? Um, what's your thoughts? So um, the big thing that we are working on, and I'm working with a very large developer with um, PRAC, with Pierce and Jenison. We're working with two very large developers, one um, north of Jacksonville and one actually in the Lake Nona area. And um, the, the trends there are, these are areas where they have water restrictions. So they have a water budget that they have to work with. There's only so much water and that those developers got their permits to build in those areas. Um, because they agreed to a water budget. And so those landscapes have to be very drought tolerant. And um, most of them are very tiny because the houses are uh, in these new developments where you know they're packing the houses in. And we're looking at using a lot more native plants, but we're also looking at um, a concept that uh, my students and I developed uh, so very soon, within probably sometime next month in January, we will be coming out with our new landscape standards books for high performance landscapes. And that book will be available um, digitally. And we're going to, uh, um, you know, Florida Friendly can make it available to anyone. Um, they can download it. And uh, in that book, we talk about a concept called the front line. That's our name for it. And um, we're looking at taking these very small yards in front of these houses and connecting them all together so that it's one long strip of planting in front of these houses. And so you look all the way down the street and the um, each yard um, just um, blends into the next yard. And um, the reason why we can do that in these new developments is because they will be having a, uh, one contractor who's going to maintain these landscapes. So Cherry Lake in the one in, um, in the Lake Nona area um, will be maintaining these landscapes. So we're looking at this, this kind of front line or strip landscaping as a way to have some very nice landscapes, to have some continuity, some unity along there and then have, um, uh, you know, a um, continuous maintenance for, for that landscape. So that's a trend. I, I mean, that's a trend we're hoping becomes a trend, but right now we're, that's what we're working on with these developers and um, they seem quite excited about it. So we'll see how that goes. Very cool, Gail. And I wanna thank you for keeping this slide up of the, the street mural. <laughs> um, it's just inspiring looking at that and seeing that incredible bougainvillea and then just, yeah. you know, transitioning to the mural. It's, uh, it's an amazing image. So, um, you, you gave us so much to think about. Thank you so very much. Um, and, and for staying over for answering all these questions. Um, I do want to thank everybody for, for tuning in to the webinar today and, uh, getting these tips from uh, from Dr. Gail Hansen, and hopefully you'll uh, be able to get her new book next uh, coming up next year. Um, I did want to point out that uh, you know we do have uh, another webinar, as Gail said, and that's coming up in January, uh, January 9th on lethal bronzing with uh, Dr. Brian Bader, um, and that's at 10 a.m. Eastern time. 
Um, just uh, we we hope everybody has a safe and happy holiday season. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the u new year. Gail, thank you so much once again. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Everybody take care. <laughs>